Hello, my name's Alice Correa. I'm an independent art historian and my research examines late 20th century British art with a specific focus on artists of African, Caribbean and South Asian heritage. Over the past few years, I've been specifically researching and writing about women artists of South Asian heritage in Britain. My research has been framed by and both and informs my personal position as someone with a mixed British South Asian heritage. Between March 2021 and March 22, I was a research fellow at the UAL's Decolonising Arts Institute on the Decolonising the Archive Fellowship Residency Programme. During my fellowship, I worked with the African Caribbean, Asian and African Art in Britain Archive held at Chelsea College of Art and its bibliography titled Recordings, edited by Melanie Keane and Elizabeth Ward and published in 1996. The title of my talk today is Place of Birth Unavailable, British South Asian Women, Artists and the Archive. In her remarkable text, The Rani of Samur, an essay in reading the archives, Gayatri Spivak discusses the epistemic violence that takes place within the colonial archive. Discussing the presence and absence of Indian women in the British colonial narrative of India, she reminds readers that, quote, the most detailed record of women's names in early colonial India is in the context of widow self-immolation. And yet, even in these instances of colonial voyeurism, names are poorly or incorrectly translated and are often incomplete. In the context of the British historical record, Spivak notes that a title and a vaguely sketched first name will suffice for the King of Samur's wife because of the specific purpose she is made to serve. Here, the Indian woman is notable only in terms of her position within a patriarchal society, her subservience to and potential self-sacrifice in honour of her husband. This colonial perception of South Asian women as subordinate has arguably held sway for generations and continued to inform perceptions and representations of women of South Asian ancestry in Britain during the late 20th century. In the history of South Asian migration to Britain during the post-war period, most women from the Indian subcontinent came to join husbands and fathers who had already taken the, undertaken the journey. These female migrants were, in the main, regarded by the British Home Office as dependents and were not conferred citizenship in their own right. As such, should fathers die or marriages end in divorce or widowhood, women were liable for deportation. It's possible to conclude then that successive British governments in the 1970s and early 1980s did not regard South Asian women as active agents in their own lives. In her 1984 essay for the special issue of Feminist Review on Black Feminist Perspectives, Parita Trevedi argued that the British colonial ideology served as an essential legitimating tool of subjugation whereby Asian women in Britain continued to be seen through the lens of servitude. She challenged her reader to conjure up a picture of an Asian woman. She asked, have the words passive, submissive been part of your portrayal? Overarching my research focus is an interest in and concern for the narrative trajectory and composition of histories of British art and the place of South Asian artists within those histories. During my fellowship at the Decolonising Arts Institute, I wanted to address the presence and absence of South Asian women artists within the archive, to think about who was included in the archive, what type of materials are held, and how useful that material is when seeking to narrate a history of South Asian women artists in Britain. The African Caribbean, Asian and African Art in Britain archive at Chelsea College of Art is unquestionably an important resource for those wishing to research the art historical moment that has, in recent years, been historicised as the Black, British Black Art Movement. Initiated in 1983 by, by librarian Liz Ward when she worked at St Martin's School of Art, 
The archive holds a wealth of information about artists of African, Caribbean and Asian heritage active in Britain during the 1980s and early 1990s. In an article published in 1985, Ward describes the context in which she started to collect materials, specifically about contemporary black artists in Britain. She noted that St. Martin's had no full-time black tutors and that the curriculum focused on Western art history. Of the materials held by the library at that time, she observed, quote, non-Western cultures are mostly represented by their traditions and not by contemporary developments. As well as recognising that the library's existing provision was inadequate, factors for establishing the archive included the requests from black students asking for information on contemporary black artists, an awareness of an increased activity by and visibility of young black artists, and an awareness of the anti-racist educational programmes within the Inner London Education Authority. Upon the foundation of the London Institute, an amalgamation of London Art Colleges, now the University of the Arts, the university found a per sorry, the archive found a permanent home at Chelsea School of Art and Design in 1985. Recordings was published by Innova in 1996 in collaboration with Chelsea College. Edited by Melanie Keane and Elizabeth Ward, um, the bibliography was a record of the archive. With the, the aim of the publication itself was to promote the archive and make its contents visible to a wider audience. The materials were organised and cross-referenced within three sections, the chronology, individual artists and general texts. The chronology listed group exhibitions by date and included bibliographic references to press releases, reviews, catalogues and other items. The individual artist section lists materials relating to solo and group exhibitions, as well as self-authored self texts. And the general text section lists items thematically by subject, such as visual arts practice, art history, photography, film, performance, and so on. But although the collection is unquestionably an incredibly rich resource, I have been confronted with significant omissions. The issue of who is or is not included in the archive and how that material is or is not documented demonstrates the limits of the collecting process and its bibli bibliographic recording, something that Ward and Keane acknowledged in a conversation about recordings um, that was filmed in 2017. Keane noted that the omission of key biographical information, such as birth and death dates, and the place of an artist's birth, from the recordings book, was a critical failing of the bibliography, and arguably those omissions compounded, compounded the fact that Black and Asian artists in Britain were, and continue to be, marginalised within mainstream institutions. But the archival blind spots were not limited to the biographical details, but included exhibitions that, were, that are crucial to the stories that I want to tell. For example, the exhibition Four Indian Women Artists, organised by Bhajan Hanjan with Shaila Berman, is absent from recordings, both in its um, chronology and in the individual um, artist listings. The exhibition included paintings and prints by Hanjin and, and Berman, alongside woman, wooden sculpture by, by Naomi Inni and ceramic works by Vinadini Ebden. The show ran from December 1981 until February 1982, and in their book Framing Feminisms, Rosika Parker and Griselda Pollock identify the show as the first exhibition of black women artists to take place in the UK. So it's highly significant, but missing from the Chelsea archive. This absence led me to think about known unknowns and our reliance on archives for uncovering hidden histories. Of the 177 names listed in the individual artist section of recordings, I have identified 26 as women of South Asian heritage. 
Some of these artists are well known today, and the archive holds significant amounts of material on artists including Zarina Bimji, Shutapa Biswas, and Shaila Kumari Berman. Zarina Bimji was nominated for the Turner Prize in 2007 and had a retrospective at the Whitechapel Gallery in 2012. Her photographic installation, Lead White, was shown at Tate Britain in 2018. Shutapa Biswas um, is also well known and had a critically acclaimed retrospective at Kettle's Yard in Cambridge in 2022. Shaila Kumari Berman was the recipient of the Tate Britain Winter Commission in 2020 and lit up um, the facade of the gallery with her vibrant neons. But what of the other artists in the recordings book and in the archive? For the remaining named artists, information is scarce, with references to only a few group shows and with significant biographical details missing. Other artists, including Anita Kushak, Raksha Patel and Alia Saeed, were not included in the individual listings, but could be identified in, in the group exhibition listings. So against the researchers hope that the archive will hold the, desi the desired document, it will answer the specific question and will provide a complete narrative. Here I was faced with partial stories and incompleteness. As Marianne Devna stresses, it is no longer possible to regard the archive as a site of inert evidence, quote, fully constituted and ultimately awaiting our judicial gaze. Instead, we're faced with the proposition that engaging with and processing archival materials is a mediating process. So while I attempted to mediate or make sense of partial and incomplete archival records, Paul Voss and Marta Werner provided a useful reminder. Quote, at times, the archive compels us to read its minimal signs with maximum energy. At others, it is the aporia within the archive that compels close reading. When archival materials are limited, close and careful reading of and between those materials can be used and launched and can be used as a launch pad for further investigations. They can provide clues identifying possible omissions, gaps, and blind spots. Indeed, Keane's admission that the Chelsea Archive is not a comprehensive or complete record of Black and Asian artistic practice in Britain, demands that it be regarded with a certain level of circumspection. Cross-referencing the bibliographic listings of recordings with other catalogues of other archives becomes critical and reveals known unknowns. So while it could be argued that the limited number of women artists in the South, of South Asian heritage listed in the individual artists section of recordings may be explained by the limited number of women from those backgrounds attending art colleges and forging artistic careers during the 1980s and 90s, this position is somewhat undermined by the Women of Colour Index, compiled by Rita Keegan and held at the Women's Art Library. The Women of, Colour Index, Women of Colour Index contains materials relating to women artists of South Asian heritage who are not present in the Chelsea Archive, including, for example, the Singh Twins. Similarly, the archives at Rochdale Art Gallery hold supplementary information on Jajit Chuhan. The archives at the Blue Coat in Liverpool hold material on Vina Stevenson. And the Panchayat Special Collection at Tate contains information about Anita Kushak and many others. However, the, the fragmentary nature and geographical dispersal of archives containing materials pertinent to the narrative of South Asian women artists in Britain points to the difficulties of establishing a coherent narrative of marginalised artistic endeavour. Considering the known limitations of the Chelsea Archive, instead of approaching the archive as a repository of complete knowledge that can serve as an antidote to art historical neglect, 
I realised that it might be more fruitfully be understood as a starting point. So what more could be said? I started to think about whether the archival listings of particular artists were commensurate with their contributions to artistic debates and curatorial practices, whether then or now, and what I could do to change that situation. So I decided to look specifically at the work and archival trace of Simrath Patti and Raksha Patel. Collating materials held in the Chelsea archive about Simrath Patti and Raksha Patel revealed a lack. My research project has become one of retrieval and expansion. Working in collaboration with Simrath and Raksha, I collated and digitized archival materials for inclusion in downloadable PDF documents, one for each artist. Titled New Recordings, they aim to fill in the gaps of the Chelsea archive, or at least some of them. I also interviewed each artist for a podcast discussing key moments in their careers. I'm now going to take a bit of time to introduce Simrath Patti and Raksha Patel. So Simrath is listed in the individual artist section of recordings and six items relating to group and solo exhibitions during the late 1980s and early 1990s are held in the archive. It did not take me long to confirm that she was born in Kenya and she studied at Leeds Polytechnic from 1981 to 84, where she experimented in a range of media, including photography, performance and painting. But these archival materials offer little insight into her formative experience at Leeds, nor do they fully convey the importance of Simrath's curatorial activity. In our podcast conversation, Simrath discusses her traumatic student career and how that experience informed her future artistic life. We also spent some time discussing her important contributions to British exhibition art histories. Simrath conceived and curated the exhibition Jagrati, an exhibition of work by Asian women artists held at the Greenwich Citizens Gallery in Woolwich in 1986. To date, the exhibition remains the largest group show of women artists of South Asian heritage staged in the UK. Having worked for Greenwich Asian Women's Art Group, Simrath's aim for Jagrati was to demonstrate how art could address and address issues how art could address issues and experiences of direct concern to the Asian community and show how art could have both personal and political resonance. We also discussed her large scale installation, Cherche la Femme, which was included in the group show Transition of Riches, staged at Birmingham Museum and Art Gallery in 1993. In her review of the show, published in Third Text, um, Tanya Gur described the work as, quote, a complex multi-layered installation that examines fissures between represented and real femininity. Briefly, the installation comprised a room set up like a 1970s living room with sculptures of Queen Victoria and Rabindranath Tagore from Birmingham's um, collection on display. A video um, in which Simrath explores sensuality and male sexuality was played across three screens um, encased in gold frames. The videos show gay Rani dancers doing movements and addresses what we might now call queer culture. But Simrath is keen to stress that this type of performative cross-dressing has a deep and complex history in India. And in the middle of all of this, was a bowl of mangoes, over which over the course of the exhibition were left to rot. A number of the reviews of the show mentioned the sensation of moving into the space and being hit by the smell of overripe and rotting mangoes. There's much more to be said about this and other works by Simrath Patti, and that critical art historical engagement with the artwork is the next stage of my research. Recordings lists only one reference to the painter Raksha Patel, a private view announcement for a group show to exhibition um, titled Stated Values, an autumn salon of fine paintings, ceramics and sculptures. 
The exhibition was organised by the 198 Gallery in Brixton, but staged at Gallery 47 in Bloomsbury in London in November 1994. What the archive does not tell us is that at the time of the show, Raksha had just started a postgraduate course in communication design at Central St. Martin's School of Art, having completed her BA in illustration at Norwich School of Art earlier that year. At the time of the exhibition, Raksha was painting in a photorealist figurative style and her work addressed issues relating to British multiculturalism, such as In Between of 1994. In our podcast conversation, Raksha contextualizes these paintings with, with reference to her experience of visiting the exhibition, Black People and the British Flag, curated by Eddie Chambers, and the way in which that show encouraged her to engage with racial politics. But simultaneously, <clears throat> during our conversation, Raksha was keen to reflect on the ways that group exhibitions of so-called Black artists and archives such as that held at Chelsea, have the potential to, to, to silo artists and place them within a limiting framework according to race. We have discussed, we discussed her conscious decision to move away from making work about identity politics um, and the ways in which she moved towards um, painting and addressing themes about the human body, the environment and global warming and these paintings such as Rising from the Depths of the Planet of 2001. So much of my research, my recent research, has taken the form of advocacy for a reconsideration of neglected artists. And my specific aim in working with Simrath and Raksha has been to make their work more visible and accessible to a broad audience. I was therefore delighted when, following a work in progress presentation about my project that was made to UAL staff, Judy Wilcox, Head of Museums and Collections at Central St. Martins, contacted Raksha and commissioned her to make a new painting in response to the historic colonial botanical prints held in the university's collection. Chelsea, the goddess of King's Cross, was painted in early 2022 and presents a Tulsi, or holy basil plant. In Hinduism, the Tulsi plant is a manifestation of Lakshmi, goddess of fortune, power, facility and prosperity. In her plant form presented here, Lakshmi symbolises virtue and purity. Raksha's painting presents the Tulsi plant, overseeing the landscape of King's Cross, an area of in intense urban regeneration and which has a long-standing Bengali community. The painting poses questions about the past and future place of the Asian women and girls in this space. In 1985, in the early days of the African, Caribbean, Asian and African Art in Britain archive, Elizabeth Ward noted that, quote, there was a virtual non-existence of documentation about contemporary black British art and contemporary minority group art more generally, in the form of books, periodicals, articles, major exhibition catalogues or videos. As such, the specialist and focused African, Caribbean, Asian and African art in Britain archive was and remains a critical resource when seeking to narrate decolonial histories of British art. However imperfect its in constitution and presentation, recognising and accepting its incompleteness allows for a sense of possibility. The agency of the archive and what it can do is not dependent or determined necessarily by what is in it, but rather how researchers work, engage and interact with its materials. Aaron Afajurai's proposition that, quote, the archive is itself an aspiration rather than a recollection, thus becomes a challenge to the imagination. If the single specialist archive is not the definitive repository of the past activities of British Asian women artists, is it possible to rethink its contents as such containing signposts that need to be closely, and cro closely read and cross-referenced? During my project at the Decolonising Arts Institute, I've sought to weave together dispersed materials held 
in other archives, organisations and in private collections and weave those stories with oral testimony in order to expand and enhance knowledge of these two wonderful but overlooked artists. Together, my podcast interviews with Raksha Patel and Simrath Patti and their respective New Recordings booklets seek to, pil- to build upon existing materials and resources available in the African Caribbean, Asian and African Art Archive in Britain and prompt future art historical investigation. But underlying the contention of my project, for the underlying contention of my project remains. Despite their presence in the archive, women artists of South Asian heritage in Britain remain on the margins of art historical scholarship. Thank you for listening.